Hey guys welcome back to another new story and without further ado let's start the story. As the story unfolds we find ourselves in an old castle on a stormy night. A man dressed in royal clothing stands before a young woman named Eusenil. He begins to act intimately towards her, causing her to recoil slightly and tug at his clothes. She asks him to wait. As he tries to undo Eusenil's clothing, he expresses his happiness that she approached him first. Just as he is about to finish, Eusenil pushes him away and calls him testfully unnuzzle. Intrigued, she questions whether the order for executing the Viscount's eldest son truly came from him. Tesfilian doesn't deny it. He explains that it's because the Viscount's son committed a wrongful act deserving of such punishment. Eusenil is puzzled about what act could justify execution, but Tesfilian quickly reveals that it's because the man proposed to her. With a threatening smile, he asserts that no one can propose to Eusenil except him, kissing her hand. Despite the man declaring his love, Eusenil appears worried and sad. He affectionately licks her fingers while repeating his words of love. Finally, he urges her to focus only on him as he pushes her down. She doesn't resist his advances but wonders how things came to this. They're about to kiss passionately, but her mind is still consumed by thoughts of how things went wrong. The scene shifts to an emergency at a hospital, where staff rush a young woman to the ER, calling for a transfusion. As her vision fades, she sees her mother in tears, begging the staff to save her daughter. She apologizes to her mother before closing her eyes for the last time. Suddenly, Eusenil wakes up, back to reality. She tries to calm herself from the haunting dream. A young blonde child, addressing her as sister, asks what's wrong. With a worried expression, Genial Hardrant, also known as Gale, checks on her older sister for any signs of distress. Their parents, Duke Melenhardran and Duchess Seal, are also concerned and halt the carriage. But Eusenil, or Yule as her parents call her, assures them everything is fine. She's feeling a bit out of sorts as she heads back to the capital after 14 years. When her companions brush it off, assuming she's just nervous, they smile and tease her gently, seeing her as their beloved daughter despite her mature demeanor. The carriage stops, and the coachman announces their arrival at the duchy manor. Not much has likely changed in her hometown during her long absence. It's been two decades since Usanil Hardrant became a stranger in this new world, a common occurrence where people find themselves transported to a fantasy realm after death. What sets her story apart is that she hasn't experienced typical fantasy media in her previous life. Initially, she thought her new reality was a dream. Born into one of the founding families of the Buck Empire, the Hardrant Duchy, she resides with her loving family. Unlike Yule, Gale has no memory of the place as their family was exiled before her birth. Yule feels guilty for their exile, but her family reassures her, showing unwavering love and support. It's the kind of family everyone wishes for, kind and supportive. Yule, though feeling like a stranger in this world, has adjusted well and feels at home. She playfully pushes her family inside the manor, grateful for their love and support, yet knowing deep down that this isn't where she truly belongs. There's something she still needs to accomplish. With a pleasant smile, she informs her parents of her decision to transfer to the Consam Research Institute. The Consam Research Institute, a renowned national institution primarily focused on mono research, boasts a rich history significant enough to contribute to the operation of the Academy for Nobles. In a world where elves, gods, and mythical beings exist, delving into mana research might offer a clue on how to return to her original world. Surprisingly, her admission to the institute is swiftly authorized, despite having recently taken the entrance exam. The process unfolds seamlessly. Upon requesting an enrollment form at the admission office, the receptionist immediately recognizes Yule from the Hardrant family indicating that they were already aware of her intention to enroll. The power of strong family connections proves remarkably convenient. Yule smiles with satisfaction, eager to commence her mana research without delay. As she traverses the premises, she is hailed by someone from afar. From their appearance alone, it's evident that these three ordinary-looking girls will likely become our protagonists, antagonists. Onlookers react to the familiar family name, recalling the family's exile during the previous empire's rule. One spectator chastises his companion, warning him to mind his words as speaking ill of the Hardrant family in the presence of the crown prince. His majesty could lead to trouble. Yule overhears their chatter and is puzzled by the mention of the crown prince's involvement with her family. Recalling a certain prince from her past, she smiles fondly, lost in the memory. However, her reverie is interrupted when the third-rate antagonist rudely calls out to her for ignoring them. The yellow-haired girl insists on confirming Yule's identity as a member of the Hardrant family, but Yule simply gazes back at her expressionlessly. She wonders if this rude individual hails from a Viscount family. 
with the Hardrin family's exile weakening the duchy's influence, the Viscount's power naturally surged. With a cold smirk, Yule decides she owes no kindness to someone displaying hostility, even though she cares little for family power struggles. Her laughter further infuriates the yellow-haired girl, who receives a pitying glance from Yule. Yule questions the girl's noble lineage, noting that addressing strangers by name indicates a lack of proper etiquette from her family. Embarrassed by Yule's remarks, the yellow-haired girl is left speechless, her jaw dropping to the floor as the surrounding spectators chuckle. She defiantly introduces herself as Lily Shane, boldly proclaiming her ambition to become an empress one day. Amid their fruitless argument, the crowd suddenly begins to bow their heads in respect as a man approaches. Meanwhile, Yule dismisses Lily's ambitions, stating she couldn't care less about such matters. Lily becomes enraged, accusing Yule of arrogance due to her past acquaintance with the now reigning monarch when he was just a crown prince. Lily belittles Yule as merely a member of the fallen Hardrant family. Approaching from behind with a sinister grin, the suspicious man catches Yule's attention. He echoes Lily's words about the Hardrant family's fallen status, sending a shiver down her spine. Claiming responsibility for the order to return the Hardrant family, he accuses someone of disobeying his command, hinting at Lily. As the crowd greets the approaching man with synchronized reverence, he commands his followers to drag Lily away and execute her. Yule observes the scene, realizing that Tess, the former crybaby prince, has ascended to the throne. But the cold gaze of the man before her remains unfamiliar. Who is this new emperor? It's revealed that within the vast universe, countless worlds exist, each isolated from the others, often unaware of each other's existence. However, occasionally, individuals traverse between these worlds, explains a young Yule as she closes the book she was reading. The book isn't what she's searching for, she seeks a method to move between worlds. This quest has occupied her since she was six years old. While reading under a tree, she's interrupted by a young blonde prince, Tess. Yule's expression suggests annoyance at his arrival, anticipating trouble. Tess approaches with a cheerful demeanor, expressing how much he missed Yule. Despite his informal approach, Yule maintains a formal tone which displeases Tess. He offers her flowers and proposes marriage, displaying boldness uncommon for children. Yule, uninterested, rejects him, stating he's not her type. Undeterred, Tess asks about Yule's ideal partner. As she's about to respond, the scene shifts back to the present, where Yule's gaze meets the cold stare of the black-haired emperor. The new Tess, starkly different from her memories. The former prince, Tessville Yuan Newsville, was once a sickly crybaby and Yule's childhood friend, often playfully pursuing her. Yule continues to gaze at the man she once knew as Tess, now so different from the person she remembers 14 years ago. She wonders about the identity of this cold-hearted individual. An elderly bystander, resembling a professor, steps in, pleading with the emperor to forgive Lily's youthful ignorance and show mercy just this once. He reveals Lily to be the youngest daughter of the Viscount Shane family, stripped of their possessions by the previous emperor. Upon ascending the throne, he vowed to restore what was taken from them. Lily, unable to contain her tears, awaits the emperor's decision. The emperor regards Lily disdainfully, scoffing at the audacity of someone from the Shane family speaking out. Yule is perplexed. While the man's appearance resembles Tess, his drastic personality change in just 14 years is bewildering. Speculating on the reason, Yule considers the possibility of Tess undergoing a villainous transformation after rejection in his youth. Observing his features closely, she notes the inconsistency. Tess should have blonde hair and blue eyes as a descendant of the imperial family. The lack of surprise at a black-haired emperor is peculiar. Yule intervenes, bowing her head and seeking forgiveness on Lily's behalf. Despite her grave mistake, Yule suggests that forgiveness would showcase the Emperor's benevolence. Tess, momentarily silent, observes Yule's formal demeanor, acknowledging her gesture. Yule believes that if this man is the Tess she once knew, he will listen to her. However, there's a possibility he may not remember her after so long. As Yule prepares to introduce herself, Tess interrupts, praising her generosity and placing his hand on her shoulder with a mysterious smile. He commends her for seeking forgiveness for someone who insulted her family. The elderly man, revealed as the school's dean, agrees with the emperor's sentiments. Tess's expression, observed by Yule, confirms his identity. Tess then lowered the punishment of Lily, reducing it to being locked up in the imperial prison. Yule watches him as he gives out the punishment, looking at him with worried and concerned eyes. His majesty asked or Yule's companion to show him around the academy. Naturally, she respectfully agreed to it but she still can't shake it off her mind how Tess's appearance changed this much. They roam around the campus, with Yule leading the way. 
Tess did not utter a single word up until they reached the forest trial. She is still preoccupied by Tess's drastic change in his appearance due to the fact that she is sure that it wasn't caused by magic since she can't feel any mana. And in this world, contact lenses and hair dyes do not exist as well. Yule ponders if there's a secret magic she's unaware of as she becomes lost in thought. Despite Tess repeatedly calling her name, she remains distant until he finally embraces her from behind, addressing her as Eusenil. His pained expression leaves Yule bewildered and uncertain of how to react. Tess apologizes, further adding to her confusion. He acknowledges her apparent frustration at his tardiness, speculating that it may be why she's been formal with him and addressed him as your majesty. Tears well up in his eyes as he desperately pleads for Yule's forgiveness. Yule gently holds his face, her touch comforting as she softly calls him by his name, Tess. Relieved to hear his name from her lips, Tess had feared she'd forgotten him. Yule harbors many questions she wants to ask Tess, particularly why he never sent a single letter during their exile. However, in that moment, such inquiries pale in comparison to seeing him cling to her, shedding tears, which softens her heart. As if transported back to their childhood, Yule wonders if Tess truly remains the same person she knew years ago. Seizing the opportunity, she questions Tess about his altered appearance and any events that occurred while she was away. In response, he simply takes her hand and kisses it, asking if she approves. Attempting to explain that such changes likely aren't due to magic, Yule is interrupted as Tess insists it's simply her preference. He recalls her previous statement about liking men with black hair and eyes, suggesting he altered his appearance to match her taste. Yule's curiosity persists, prompting her to inquire further. Tess responds by drawing her closer, enveloping her in a tender embrace that quiets any further questions. He reassures her that as the Emperor, they no longer need to be apart and she won't have to endure insults like earlier. As Tess playfully nibbles her ear and professes his love, promising eternal togetherness, calling her his Eusenial, Yule feels a sense of unease amidst the romantic atmosphere. It seems to her like she's fallen into a perfect trap. Despite his declarations, she can't shake the feeling of eeriness. Flashback to their childhood, Yule, known as the child who never cried, and Tess, dubbed the perpetual crybaby. Yule always gazed straight at her parents without shedding a tear, while Tess was characterized by his constant tears and emotional sensitivity. The Emperor, concerned about Tess's lack of companionship, orchestrated a meeting between the two peculiar children. Since then, Tess claims his eyes no longer ache. Instead, they find solace in Yule's presence his innocence shining through his smile. Tess has been devoted to Yule ever since their childhood encounter. Though Yule finds it somewhat annoying when he makes various excuses to visit her home, she doesn't truly mind. Almost every time she contemplates finding a way back to her original world, Tess appears unexpectedly at her window, bearing flowers and expressing his longing for her, much to her surprise and delight. Surprised by Tess's sudden appearance, Yule falls silent, prompting him to inquire if she's injured. However, she responds with an infectious smile, teasing him for his unconventional entrance through the window. Tess's affection provides Yule with occasional comfort. Each visit invariably includes talk of marriage, as Tess expresses a desire to avoid the inconvenience of traveling back and forth to see her. Initially, Yule dismisses these discussions as childish complaints, assuming Tess is still naive about the ways of the world. She never imagines his behavior could change based on her words, unaware of the profound impact they can have. Lost in thought, Yule is startled when Tess closes in on her face and questions her thoughts in his presence. Whispering that he's disappointed, his words shock her to the core, prompting a violent reaction. Yule pushes him away, addressing him by his full name, Tess Fulian, and chastising him for going too far. Her distraught expression reflects her serious intent as she firmly asserts she won't tolerate such jokes anymore. Tess, feeling a pang of disappointment, witnesses Yule's unwavering resolve regarding his feelings. Despite Yule's preoccupation with whether Tess truly altered his appearance in response to her words, His Majesty confirms her suspicions, admitting to changing his clothing to match her preferences. Blushing slightly, he asks if she likes it. However, Yule's expression reveals her inner turmoil. She's unsure where things went wrong and continues to contemplate. Tess offers to change all the decorations to black if she desires, but Yule isn't interested in superficial changes, she wants to know how he changed his appearance. A heavy silence descends between them as Yule presses him for an explanation, but Tess remains silent. With a mischievous glint in his eyes, he finally speaks up, proposing a deal. He'll reveal the truth only if she agrees to marry him. 
Yule is left speechless, stunned by his sudden seriousness after his carefree demeanor. A mix of astonishment and distress crosses her beautiful face, leaving her utterly distraught and at a loss for words. The Hardrant family returns from exile after 14 years. Yule feels offended by Lily's remarks on the street. Tess, now the Emperor, steps in to defend Yule. As they catch up on lost time, they have many questions for each other. Later, Tess tells Yule she'll only explain his changed appearance if she agrees to marry him, which puts her in a difficult position. Yule wonders if her family's exile might be related to his altered looks, but Tess avoids giving a clear answer. Frustrated, Yule decides to leave. Tess persists, offering a gift and asking to accompany her home but Yule declines. Tess reveals the gift is access to the royal library, including its new annex with extensive magic books. She tempts Yule with the opportunity to rent any book except those banned, enticing her with the promise of valuable research material. Once again, the mischievous prince sets a romantic atmosphere. As Yule holds the library entrance badge, he delicately takes a strand of her hair, admiring its scent, and then kisses it with the charm of a true prince captivating his princess. Startled, Yule pulls away, attempting to reprimand Tess for his inappropriate behavior. But before she can speak, Tess bids her farewell, mentioning he'll wait for her at the palace, standing by a teleportation portal. Urging her to hurry as his patience wears thin, he disappears through the portal, leaving behind a faint mist. Yule, stunned, tries to make sense of what just happened. She's astonished that someone like Tess can wield teleportation magic, the most advanced form of magic. The scene shifts to the sound of swords clashing within the duchy mansion. Yule and her training partner engage in intense sword practice, the echoes of their blades ringing through the halls. While Yule is deeply focused on improving her skills, her partner pleads for a moment's respite. Her sparring partner, Edel Bornart, takes a step back, catching his breath, and suggests that Yule takes a break. He remarks that she's pushing herself too hard, but Yule remains resolute, insisting he's still not strong enough. Edel, also a member of the Royal Guard, acknowledges Yule's exceptional swordsmanship, stating that only she would dare call a Royal Guard weak. As Yule hydrates herself, Edel explains that her elven heritage grants her extraordinary strength. Upon her return to the capital, she promptly joined the Conceum and has the endurance to train tirelessly for days. Drawing closer, Yule playfully teases Edel about neglecting to write her while she was away. But Edel refutes her claim, affirming that he sent her numerous letters. Transitioning to a more earnest tone, he admits to putting great effort into composing those letters. Touched by his sincerity, Yule drops the teasing and changes the subject. She inquires if he continued visiting the palace after her family's exile to the barren lands. With a concerned expression, she asks his opinion on whether Tess has changed. However, Edel, not as close to the monarchy as Yule, maintains that in his eyes, Tess remains the same as when he was the crown prince. After their initial meeting, Yule questioned everyone, including her parents, about any changes in Tess. However, they all claim not to notice any alterations in the prince, not even his physical appearance. Edel's remark about the situation being unsettling catches Yule's attention. He goes on to explain that there's been a sense of unease since Tess took the throne, describing it as a troubling atmosphere. Yule falls silent, troubled by Edel's words despite knowing Tess's former sweetness and innocence. Though their recent interaction aligns with her memories of him, she can't shake off Edel's concerns. With a concerned expression, the knight advises Yule to avoid getting too involved. Listening to her instincts, Yule reluctantly agrees with Edel's advice, but she can't shake off a lingering feeling. Despite warnings from her friend and her own intuition telling her not to go, Yule finds herself drawn to the royal palace. She simply can't resist the opportunity to learn more about magic. As she enters the castle, unaware of being watched from a window, she is observed by Tess, who remarks that he's been eagerly awaiting his usenil. Uncertainty and worry clouded Yule's expression as she steeled herself to approach the castle grounds. Inside the castle halls, noblemen engaged in gossip about the youngest daughter of the Sheen Duke. Concealing her identity beneath a cloak, Yule overhears their conversation, learning that the commotion was allegedly caused by the Hardrant family, recently summoned back to the capital. They speculate whether this could lead to an empress from a royal lineage. Displeased by how quickly the rumor has spread, Yule reflects on the situation. The Empire's influence is divided into two prominent factions, the founding dukes and those supported by the Empress. Initially, the plan was for the duke's family to have their chosen empress from among their daughters, favored by the previous emperor. However, this plan was abandoned due to Tess's pursuit of Yule. As a result, their family has been barred from aspiring to the empress's position. Adding to their troubles, rumors circulate that Yule is heading to the palace immediately upon her return. 
deeply concerned, she doesn't want to bring any more harm to her family. For Yule, the 14-year exile her family endured because of her was already burdensome enough. She sees no justification for them to endure further hardship, so she is determined to keep a low profile. We are taken back 14 years to a time when Yule was still a quiet and endearing child. Summoned to the imperial court by the previous emperor, Yule stood with her parents by her side. The Hardrant family couldn't help but notice something amiss with the emperor, causing them all to gaze at him with apprehensive expressions. Looking visibly exhausted and worn, the emperor summons Yule, indicating that he has something to inquire from her and urges her to answer truthfully. Descending from his throne, he advances towards the Hardrant family, questioning Yule about her preference for the color black. With the emperor uncomfortably close, he probes further, asking if her ideal partner possesses dark hair and black eyes, to which Yule responds affirmatively, maintaining a stoic demeanor. Suddenly, a malevolent glint flickers in the Emperor's eyes, followed by a maniacal laughter. Sensing the sinister turn of events, Tess's mother instinctively shields her from the Emperor. The deranged Emperor begins ranting, claiming that even the priests have given up on the elf. He asserts that the only name Tess calls out is Yule's and then proceeds to label her as an illegitimate child. Yule's mother intervenes, placing her hand on Yule's shoulder to reassure her safety, while admonishing the emperor from the Northern Empire to mind his words. She vehemently defends Yule's honor, stating that elves are revered symbols of virtue and purity, rendering the accusation of illegitimacy against her daughter, who bears elf blood, utterly baseless. She further asserts that whatever happened to the emperor's son was his own choice, urging the emperor not to take his frustrations out on their innocent daughter. Her words prompt the emperor to react with disbelief, placing his palm to his face in exasperation. With a chilling demeanor, he coldly orders for Yule to be sent to the barren lands and locked away for the remainder of her life. Upon hearing this, his father intervenes, refusing to allow Yusinil to be sent away alone. He declares that if his daughter is to be exiled, their entire family will accompany her. The emperor reluctantly concedes to his demands. Before departing the room, the emperor asserts that this is the greatest leniency he can afford to the Hardrant family. This traumatic scene remains etched in the memory of our poor protagonist. Even to this day, Yule recalls every detail of that fateful day vividly. She gazes at the massive door of the hallway, contemplating that she never envisioned herself returning to this place. Despite her return, the atmosphere still feels unpleasant to her. Someone lurks in the shadows, trailing behind her. It's Tess, overhearing Yule's comment about the unsettling atmosphere, leaving him momentarily speechless. Upon reaching the royal library, Yule is struck with awe and admiration at the sight before her. Her eyes sparkle with excitement as she takes in the library's growth since her last visit. However, her moment of admiration is interrupted when someone approaches her from behind, inquiring about her identity. It's an elderly man, likely the librarian who informs her that this area is restricted to those not of the royal lineage, adjusting his monocle. Suddenly, he recognizes Yule, exclaiming her name, Yusinil, in surprise. With a smile, Yule motions for him to lower his voice. The interaction between them is warm. Yule remarks on how the librarian's beard hasn't changed in the 14 years since they last met, while the old man mentions he had been anticipating her return as per the emperor's instructions. The librarian informs her that upon Tess's coronation, he was tasked with gathering all the books Yule had shown interest in as a child. Our protagonist is touched by Tess's gesture, grateful that he remembered her after all those years. The librarian directs her to the section of golden books. After bidding farewell, he assures Yule to call upon him if she requires additional books. Yule expresses her appreciation, and they part ways. As Yule delves into her studies, the number of books she accumulates grows. With her characteristic elegance and diligence, she peruses the pages of the book she holds, embodying the image of a scholarly individual. Despite her composed exterior, her thoughts wander elsewhere. She reflects on the words of the previous emperor during her exile to the barren lands and Tess's transformation. It troubles her that while Tess remembered her, he left her family stranded in barren lands for a year after becoming emperor, fostering resentment within her. For Yule, life in the barren lands wasn't entirely unbearable. While harsh with perpetual snow, she encountered a skilled swordsman, maintained rigorous training and enjoyed freedom from noble constraints. However, she couldn't justify her families and just exile alongside her. They were innocent bystanders. As the search for magic-related books proves challenging, Yule begins to lose hope of returning to her former world. 
Despite understanding that Tess wasn't to blame, she struggles to suppress her emotions and cannot simply overlook the past. Suddenly, the infamous prince appears out of nowhere, addressing Yule as Eusenil as he settles beside her. Caught off guard, Yule's expression betrays a sense of repulsion. However, the enigmatic prince simply smiles at her, projecting an air of innocence and aloofness. Yule purposely avoided registering her name and snuck into the library to avoid precisely this situation. Yet Tess sits beside her, unfazed, wearing a nonchalant smile. Distressed and already overwhelmed, Yule can't contain her emotions and impulsively asks Tess why he can't just leave her alone. However, the prince brushes it off, playfully claiming it's because he likes her. Seizing the opportunity, Yule repositions herself to face the emperor. Placing a hand on his shoulder, she meets his gaze with sincerity and questions why no one acknowledges his physical transformation as if they're blind to it. Tess is momentarily taken aback, responding with a simple what. However, he then intertwines his fingers with Yule's and teasingly asks if she's intrigued by him. Exploiting her curiosity, he kisses her hand and expresses his delight that Yule is showing interest in him. Whether the Emperor is oblivious or simply persistent remains uncertain. Noticing that Yule is tolerating his advances, Tess escalates the situation by licking her fingers, feeling a mix of curiosity. Concern and conflicting emotions towards the prince, Yule blushes and displays a worried expression in her eyes. Suddenly, she forcefully grabs Tess's clothes, stunning the mischievous prince. Slamming him against the table, she demands that he stop. The emperor is visibly bewildered and dazed by the sudden action. Confused, he looks at Yule, wondering what's happening. Leaning in closer, Yule asserts angrily that she will no longer tolerate his behavior. The two locked eyes in an intense gaze, neither daring to blink. Despite the tension, there's an underlying romantic atmosphere. Time passes, yet the silence remains unbroken until the prince lets out a meek cough. He bursts into laughter, remarking on Yule's newfound strength. Yule brushes off his comment and urges him to stop fooling around. As Yule begins to forget the topic of their conversation, she attempts to disengage from their awkward position. But, true to his mischievous nature, the prince seizes the opportunity and suddenly grabs Yule. His action causes her to lean even closer to him, as he casually mentions that he's quite comfortable where he is. Despite the prince's innocent facade and charming smile, ever since their reunion, he's done nothing but take advantage of her. Yule is clearly reaching the limits of her patience. Suddenly, the library is rocked by a loud shout of enough. The next moment, books and papers are strewn across the floor. Though the exact events are unclear, we see Tess scratching the back of his head in pain. He remarks to Yule that it was rather harsh of her to push him away without explanation, to which she retorts that he should be thankful she didn't hit him harder. Out of the blue, Tess remarks that it appears she encountered a skilled swordmaster in the barren lands. He observes that she has grown even stronger since their childhood. Yule is slightly puzzled by how Tess learned about her master, but by now, she's no longer surprised. Reflecting to herself, she notes that her childhood friend, once a crybaby with a frail body, has undergone more than just a physical transformation. A feeling of unease grips Yule as she becomes increasingly curious about what has transpired with Tess. It strangely unsettles her yet draws her attention. She doesn't understand why she keeps looking at him. Turning away, she's suddenly struck by the thought of being attracted to Tess's new appearance, which aligns with her ideal type. Tess blushes as he notices Yule's reaction to his appearance. He comments that the price he paid for such a change was worth it. Hearing her childhood friend mention paying a price, Yule becomes even more concerned about the truth behind his appearance. She bombards him with questions about how he changed his hair and eye color, and why no one has noticed his transformation. She implores him to answer honestly, without evasion or changing the subject. With a heavy heart, Tess reveals that he made a pact with the Imperial Palace. Yule doesn't fully grasp the significance but senses it's not a positive development. The Emperor elaborates that the First Emperor, in facing resistance from neighboring countries and power struggles with nobles, contemplated the risk of betrayal from his subjects. His solution was to synchronize himself with the Imperial Palace, allowing him to monitor anyone within its walls. The pact persisted through successive emperors, granting them the same ability. In essence, the castle and the kingdom now belong to the Emperor, quite literally. It was a closely guarded secret passed down only to the successors, so it's understandable that Yule wouldn't be aware of it. He further explains that his abilities surpass those of his predecessors. He can manipulate the memories of anyone who has entered the castle, even once. It's a truly formidable pact, offering immense power to a ruler governing countless subjects. Yule is left speechless, finding it all too complex to comprehend. 
The fact that he discusses such tremendous powers so casually leaves her bewildered. While Yule is lost in thought, Tess maintains a casual smile, as if he hadn't just disclosed a highly confidential piece of information. Now, her question regarding why no one reacted to his change in appearance is answered. All the nobles who attended his coronation entered the castle, allowing him to manipulate their memories. This sudden revelation doesn't alleviate Yule's curiosity, instead, it intensifies it. Even though the first emperor's magic was formidable, it's unusual for such power to persist across generations after his death, unless there's a powerful entity involved. There must be a mysterious force at play here. This only intensifies Yule's desire to delve deeper into the study of magic. She realizes that if Tess can manipulate the memories of those in the castle, why are her memories unaffected? The answer lies in her bloodline. Tess reveals that Yule's half-elf heritage is the reason her memories remain intact. This sheds some light on why her mother emphasized that the elf bloodline symbolizes purity. It grants her a degree of immunity to manipulation. Expanding on this, he explains that beings like elves or fairies, often referred to as the children of light, possess resistance to the abilities of the royal family. Yule's anxiety about the situation escalates. She questions the emperor if he isn't concerned at all, but Tess nonchalantly asks her what there is to worry about. Then she poses a hypothetical scenario. What if she were to start revealing to everyone that the emperor is orchestrating a massive deception? Tess is taken aback, his eyes widening as he stares at her, clearly caught off guard by Yule's unexpected threat. Tess didn't plan to follow through with her threats, but she couldn't help feeling a bit mischievous for testing her friend like that. Still, Yule's motivations are selfish. She thinks if she doesn't get back at him somehow, she won't be able to forget being ignored for 14 years. Even though Tess's intentions might seem tricky, she stays strong and trusts that Yule won't betray her. He gently takes her hand and starts to lift it carefully. Then he softly places her hand against his handsome face, smiling gently with calm eyes. He tells her that ever since then, Tess has always been on his side and that she's the only one for him. Our heroine's troubled expression is evident. What Tess is saying is both true and not true at the same time. She has always been there for him, supporting him through everything. It's clear she sees him as a valuable friend. However, Tess didn't realize that he has changed a lot, both in looks and personality. Because of this, Yul's feelings have also changed. When our girl turns to leave, Tess tells her she's leaving, which makes the prince beg her to stay. But Yul continued walking away nonetheless. He brings up that it was her who wanted him to change, so why is she leaving now? Yule stays silent. As she nears the door and prepares to open it, Tess resorts to threats. She warns that if things keep going like this between them, he'll have Lily Shane executed. Despite hearing that, Tess opens the door and confidently tells him to do whatever he wants. She's about to leave when the prince speaks up in a meek voice, asking if she doesn't like this version of him either. Hearing the pain in his voice, Tess is momentarily stopped. But even so, she has to stick to her decision. She closes her eyes and tries to calm herself down. Tess says goodbye to the prince and closes the door, leaving him alone in the dark room. He can only keep calling for her name, while she's outside the room, clearly upset too. It's not that she hates the changes in his appearance. When she told him it was her type for a guy, she really meant it. But right now, she needs time to sort out her feelings. She needs space to think things through so she doesn't act impulsively. For now, they need to keep their distance from each other. Inside the dark and lonely room, we hear the prince sobbing after being rejected by our girl. Tears keep flowing, and a dark aura surrounds him as he admits he can't live without Yule by his side. Meanwhile, dusk falls on the horizon, and we see our girl walking down the hallway. Tessa's words keep echoing in her mind. She can't stop wondering what he meant when he said she also hates him. What is he implying? Who else hates him? As those words echo in her mind, she can't help but imagine lonely Tess, isolated and unable to express himself properly, feeling misunderstood and alone. That image reminded her of how she had always been there for him, the only person who saved him from loneliness. Since they met, the strange and awkward prince started wearing genuine smiles. Every time they saw each other, he got excited. Each meeting felt like the first, with the joy and excitement staying consistently strong. At one point in her life, our girl felt the same way, but now she's not so sure anymore. Then, she sees a mini version of herself and Tess walking around the same hallway. The prince happily clings to her, saying he's excited they can attend magic class together, even though in reality, he nagged the duke so he could come along. The innocent mini Tess smiles at her, while Yule thinks it's a great chance to learn magic by going to the grand mage's class. He holds onto her even tighter, saying that her happiness brings him endless joy. These two really make the perfect adorable little couple, and with the bond they've formed from being together all the time, it's undeniable. Tess trusted our girl unconditionally. 
and with the same sentiment, Yul also trusted her with all his heart back then. We get to see more of what happened 14 years ago. Inside the classroom, the kids address the Grand Mage in a very formal and proper manner. Yusinil introduces herself to the Grand Mage, stating that she comes from the Heartland family. With an elegant posture, she bows before the mage and tells him that it's an honor to meet him. It's impressive that at such a young age, this girl knows proper noble etiquette. Well, at least in front of other people, because we all know she's already an adult inside. She looks at the grand mage with great admiration and respect. She can tell this old man is amazing. The old man with long white hair and a beard is the grand mage, and he smiles at her gesture. The grand mage is the embodiment of magic, one of the finest practitioners of the craft, if not the best. But even so, our girl can't help but wonder if he knows how to cross between dimensions. Maybe he could even notice that she's from another world, along with the fact that she's reincarnated. While Yule was having such thoughts, something catches the Grand Mage's attention, which surprises him. Yule thinks the old man is finally catching up to the situation, but is disappointed when she learns he was just surprised by her politeness. Tess is incredibly proud of her friend and boasts about her being incredibly smart, pretty, and the kindest in the world. With his last statement, he joyfully declares that she is going to marry him, smiling from ear to ear. Immediately after hearing that, Yule feels embarrassed and turns to look at the Empress's courtiers to see their reactions. But they don't say a word or react. Nonetheless, she still scolds him for uttering embarrassing words. He was saddened from being scolded and asked why. Then, in an instant change of mood, the sulking prince answers his own question, saying that someone might hear their marriage talk. With a cold and terrifying gaze, he looks at the courtiers and threatens them with his stare. The courtiers feel a chill run down their spine as they see the dreadful gaze of his majesty, but they can't say a word. They just flinch from fear. Taking Tess's words as their cue to leave, the courtiers excuse themselves. The three might have understood each other with just a gaze, but Yule has no idea what's happening. She has no clue about innocent Tess's sinister side, but she wasn't given much time to assess the situation further as the Grand Mage declares the start of the lesson. He starts off by explaining the stereotype of how people often think of rituals and spells when it comes to magic, when in fact, all magic originates from mana. While the mage was explaining, we can see our studious girl paying full attention to the lecture, while the naughty prince just keeps staring at her, lost in his own thoughts. The grand mage further explains that mana is the basic form of energy that sustains life, and if they intend to join official classes, they need to understand this fundamental first. Without hesitation, the ever-diligent Yule starts reading books in pursuit of knowledge. Even at her young age, we can really see the dedication she puts into studying. She then asks the Grand Mage a question, which the old man is ready to answer. She asks if the Grand Mage knows about the angel in the lumberjack folklore of Mount Gwanixon. Meanwhile, the prince tries to butt in, saying he's seen that in the library, but he's completely ignored. The story of the angel and the lumberjack who stole the clothes of an angel who came down to the pond of Mount Gwanixon and the angel who fell in love with him but had to return to heaven. Folklore is often based on real events, so our girl is curious. She says that the sky where the angel lives and the earth where the lumberjack is are totally different worlds. She thinks to herself how similar it was to her situation. She was reborn in this world, so she wonders if the angel could have also crossed dimensions. She asks if there is a way to go to another world. Such curious questions pique the interest of the Grand Mage. He says that it's an interesting inquiry. Yule clenches her fist, hoping she would have the answer she seeks. The Grand Mage replies that the essence of her question is mana. Mount Gwanxin is famous as a place where a lot of mana gathers from generation to generation. If they use the mana of the mountain, opening a door to another world is not entirely impossible. Hearing that, Yule's face brightens up with delight. This means that it's not completely impossible for her to return to her original world. After studying for so long, she finally hears an answer that allows for this possibility. She stands up with excitement, ready to ask another question to the Grand Mage, but she stopped as he isn't done with his answer yet. He clarifies that even if that's the case, even the Grand Mage himself doesn't know of a way to open such a door. This truth hits the poor heroine hard, her hands shaking on the table. She asks how come he doesn't know when he is the most prestigious magic user. The Grand Mage explains that it was only possible because it was an angel that crossed worlds. No matter how hard humans try, such a race will never be able to achieve that kind of feat. At this point, all the life has been drained out of Yule. She thought she had finally found a way to return. Of course, our attentive prince noticed the sudden change in mood of his beloved Yule. He looks at her with utmost concern but is unable to say anything to console her. 
To not rule out all possibilities, the old man says that Mount Guangxin has remained a mystery since ancient times, and that there might be a passage connected to another world. If a being is a non-human entity like ancient dragons or gods, they might know of a way. But this didn't relieve any sadness from our girl, since she knows that encountering one of those beings would be near impossible. Then, Tess raised the question, what about demons? He asks if the demons would know such a method as well. But the Grand Mage did not entertain his question. He says that such ominous words should not be uttered in the palace. Demons are wicked beings that lure humans with sweet words and temptations. The old man continues to talk about how evil demons are, but the prince is no longer listening. What's important to him is our girl's feelings. The scene switches to outside the Heartland Manor at night. The sky is filled with shining stars, and the surroundings are enveloped in silence and peace. Inside the mansion, the light in Yule's room is still on, and we see our girl still trying to find ways to return to her world. Beside her is the joyful prince, happy that he gets to sleep in Yule's room. But for this to happen, he threw a tantrum in front of the carriage in order to get permission to have a sleepover. Yule gave this naughty prince a well-deserved bonk on his nose, but she says that she doesn't really care if the empress were to scold them for this. Tess took the chance and invited her to just live in the palace, but our girl says that she won't be able to sleep there because she can barely even breathe in that place. Tess mentions that it's because Yule is too kind. The palace's gloomy atmosphere clashes with her cheerful personality. Then, he pulls the young lady towards him, catching her by surprise. As she falls towards him, he gives her a kiss on her cheek, saying that they should get married already. Dude's got no chill, smooth as ever. But don't pull that move in real life, folks, or the police might come knocking. After that, he hides in the sheets and tells our flustered Yule goodnight. His crybaby and willful behavior sometimes annoys our heroine, but she doesn't hate it. He holds her hand and tells her not to worry too much, and that whatever happens, her will is his command. Will he do anything to make all of Yule's dreams come true? Even though he doesn't really know what she wants, Yule still appreciates and loves his affection and assurance. The scene switches to our girl being in the hospital. She hears people shouting that she has been stabbed and is bleeding severely. Blood transfusion is a priority. It's the very scene she saw when she was about to die in her previous life, which continues to haunt her in her sleep. She watches her mother weep for her, pleading with her not to leave her alone. This scenario, no matter how many times she sees it, still breaks her heart. Every time she gets this nightmare, all she can do is apologize to her mom for leaving first. Something terribly wrong is happening to her body. The sensation is akin to being torn apart. Yul falls to the ground, bleeding from her nose and some parts of her body. It's as if she is reliving the incident all over again. With a sense of helplessness, she begins to cry and calls out for her mother to save her. At that moment, a loud shout of her voice is heard, waking our gal from the hellish nightmare. It was Tess, who looks at her with a face worried sick to death. He tells her to get a grip, continuing to repeat her name until Yule tells him that she is fine now. The sweet innocent atmosphere was cut short when Yule noticed that Tess is being disclosed to her, to which he immediately apologizes. Yule decides to play it off and starts getting up, saying that Tess is not giving her a break, but the kid was just genuinely concerned for her and he makes sure that she knows it. In reality, it did hurt her. The nightmare was too much to bear, and it has been consuming her. She can still vividly remember how it felt to be stabbed with a knife. Ever since she was reborn in this new world, she keeps on having the same dreams of her previous life. From the moment she was stabbed by a thug to the moment she died in the hospital, it all kept on repeating. To her, it feels like this world is rejecting her, urging her to return to her original world. It's as if she has been cursed to not achieve peace of mind. But of course, she won't let Tess know anything about this, no matter how curious and genuinely concerned he is. Yule tells him that it was nothing and everything is fine, making the poor prince sulk. The prince casually mentions that he was really trying to wake her up because she was making such a troubled face, but he doesn't fail to mention how much he wants to kiss her. Yule gets off the bed and invites Tess to eat breakfast, which Tess does not decline. Several mouth-watering dishes are served at the table for their breakfast. They were about to eat when a sudden voice came out of nowhere, calling our girl out. It was her mother. As soon as she reaches her adorable daughter, she lifts her up and spins her around. Yule is clearly annoyed by her mother treating her like a kid and mentions that she is strong as always. Her mother says that it is because she is an elf that she has such physical prowess. The panel switches to a doting mother saying that her child is still young and that it would be nice if she could still sleep with them. Yule, on the other hand, is acting accordingly. This is one adorable panel, thank you, artist. 
The mother and daughter's sweet atmosphere is interrupted by someone gently grabbing the mother's shoulder. It was her father, the duke, and he says that it is improper to act this way in front of the crown prince. The mother realizes her mistake and apologizes to the prince, but Tess just smiles happily and greets her a good morning. It was a warm, pleasant morning. The beauty of the mansion's interior is highlighted by the bright sunlight. They are all happily enjoying their lavish breakfast, eating away their hunger with elegance. Well, all of them except for Tess, who seems to have trouble moving his hands today. Yule notices that his fingers are hurt, which is why he can't eat properly. She offers her food, all cut up, to him and prompts him to show her his hand. Looking visibly worried, she scolds him for hurting his hands again. Noticing this lovely atmosphere, the Duchess can't help but comment on how Yule seems to have a soft spot for the crown prince. But she brushes it off, saying that it is not the case. No, really, it is not the case. She just can't help but be concerned hearing how he is in pain. But the mother is completely oblivious to the situation and just stares at them. In this world, Yule's family is harmonious and healthy, but that wasn't the case in her previous life. Her father abandoned their family and lived with another woman, leaving her mother to take responsibility for her alone. Her mother, who was weak to begin with, saw her health decline after her father's infidelity. Despite that, she only showed kindness and unconditional love. All throughout her previous life, she lived with the words I'm in pain on her lips. That is why when she sees Tess, it reminds her of her mom and she tends to take care of him even more. Now, we see how Tess's mom was clumsy like the naughty prince. Despite their pain, they both still smile. These memories make Tess really miss her mom. She wonders how her mom is doing after passing away and hopes she isn't mad at her. Tess doesn't dislike her parents in this new world. She's actually really thankful for their love. But she can't stop thinking about her mother crying desperately, begging her not to leave her alone. Unlike her new family, her original mother only has Yule. So, she needs to go back to her original world as soon as possible. Then, all the nightmares and pain, like being stabbed with a knife, will stop. She remembers what the Grand Mage said, that Mount Guanaxin has always been a mystery, and there might be a gateway there to another world. So, our sweet girl tries to get her elf mother's attention. She hints that elves, unlike humans, are closer to the fairy realm. She nervously asks her elf mother if she knows how to move between worlds, ending with an innocent smile. Her hands tremble with anticipation and anxiety for the answer she'll receive. She really needs to go back. In her mind, all she thinks about is being by her mother's side again. We find out there are only 100 days left until the Heartland family's exile. The Duchess is puzzled by her daughter's sudden and strange question. She asks Yule why she's curious about such a thing. It would be easier if she could just ask for help directly. Despite being loved as their true daughter, she can't let anyone know she doesn't belong here, no matter what. Yule makes up an excuse, saying she's been studying with the Grand Mage and there's something she doesn't understand. Maybe her mother, being the only elf in the capital, might have the answer. The innocent mother accepts her excuse happily and is glad to be recognized by her cute little daughter. Seeing her genuine reaction, Yule can't help but feel guilty for deceiving her. Despite everything, her mother's expression turns regretful, saying she can't give information about other worlds. This response shocks Yule. It suggests her mother does know something but can't say. Yule becomes desperate and tells her she came from the fairy world, so she must know something. But the Duchess stays firm, saying it's a secret she can't reveal. Sadness fills the elf's eyes as she really wants to answer her daughter's innocent question, but can't break confidentiality. She explains that unlike fairies born and living in the fairy realm, elves have to keep truths unspoken while living in the human realm due to a certain restriction. It's like a contract signed by the elf race, a safeguard to maintain the order of the world they live in. Growing more curious and anxious, Yule bombards her mother with questions, asking if the contract is with a god and if so, which one? She wants to know because there are two gods known in the content. On the sidelines, Tess notices Yule's anxious behavior. Despite all the questions, her mother just says she doesn't really know the specifics of the contract. This whole situation brings Yule down, leaving her shocked. It's a disaster really. Asking her mother was her last hope of finding a way. After they finish breakfast, we see Tess worriedly watching Yule. She's frantically searching for books to find answers, leaving materials scattered on the floor. Tess suggests she calms down a bit, but her concern falls on deaf ears as Yule continues to toss books aside, one by one, looking for the one she needs. And then she finds it, an ancient-looking book with a cover hinting at its age. Yule immediately opens it and skims through it. Having no choice, Tess joins Yule in skimming the book. The text explains that in the beginning, there were two gods, Lux, the god of light, 
and Demon, the god of darkness. Lux created the continent and taught humans their way of life, protecting them from the temptations of Demon. As time passed, the gods vanished, but the continent remained divided between believers and non-believers, leading to endless wars. Unfortunately, that's all the book could offer about the gods, leaving you all feeling disheartened and disappointed. The rest of the content focuses on the Northern Empire, which has been losing to the Southern Empire, facing consecutive defeats since the arrival of the First Emperor. Unlike the Southern Empire, the Northern Empire doesn't have a state religion, so their studies about gods are relatively weak. Ewell had hoped for more information since most of the Northern Empire now believes in the godlucks, but unfortunately, nothing seemed helpful. Feeling defeated, she lies down, contemplating what to do next with such limited resources. Tess lies down beside her, mentioning that Eusenil seems off today. As usual, he smiles and tries to console Ewell with his charm. Ewell tells him it's time to return to the palace since he's been there for a while. But the prince insists on staying a bit longer. Seeing how much he cares for her, she asks him directly if he really likes her that much. Without hesitation, Tess confirms that he truly adores her. The bold prince, being his usual direct self, suggests she just come and live with him already. This surprises Ewell, her eyes widening in shock. He continues, saying his parents have approved of him marrying a really nice person, and that description fits Ewell perfectly. Hearing this, Ewell gets up and sternly tells Tess never to say such things again in front of others, catching the innocent boy off guard. Her reaction may seem out of place, but it's because the prince's mother is watching with intense eyes. Ewell knows the queen regularly hosts children's exchange parties to arrange a match between her son and the young master of the Duchy of Sheen. She wonders if Tess is unaware of this fact. She tries to brush it off, telling Tess he needs to be older before he can get married, shocking the innocent boy. Ewell adds that they can't get married because she has different preferences. Tess becomes sad and acknowledges that he knows what Ewell likes. According to him, she prefers a man who doesn't cry, is skilled in magic but not arrogant, and looks like the night sky with black hair and black eyes. Ewell stands up and acknowledges that Tess truly understands her. With a cold expression, she says it's time to leave. But the poor boy starts to cry. With his blonde hair and blue eyes, he grabs Yule and timidly asks if there's a way for him to change her preferences. His face turns beet red with sadness, tears streaming down from his adorable puppy eyes. Yule looks at him with pity, knowing they're still children. She's not naive, she knows the prince's feelings for her are genuine. Despite that, she remains firm in her decision. Yule gently pulls her dress from his hands, saying he's already failed the no-crying part. Besides, one's preferences can't be changed on a whim. At such a young age, this poor prince has already experienced heartbreak. No wonder he's turned somber, but he refuses to give up. Unable to control his emotions, he hugs Yule and desperately pleads for her to like him back. He promises her all the riches in the world and lets her read all the books she wants. But no matter how desperately he pleads, Yule's heart remains unmoved. With a firm gaze, she tells him he can't have everything his way by throwing a tantrum. One cannot force a heart to change, Yule adds softly. With a defeated voice, the prince says he understands and apologizes for his actions. With everything said and done, Yule remains composed and invites him to return to the palace. Tess stays quiet for a moment. He clenches his fist and softly says, I don't. Yule doesn't hear him, so she asks what he means. In his mind, Tess is thinking about how he doesn't want to go back. He doesn't want to be away from her. But he manages to push aside those thoughts and returns to his usual cheerful demeanor, saying he'll go back if she holds his hand. With a sigh, she allows him to do as he pleases. It's not like she didn't expect this. Yule is always kind to him, but that's not enough for the prince. He wants all her attention, all her love. He stays calm, thinking about how to make Yule fall in love with him. The scene switches to outside the manor, where we see Yule diligently practicing her swordsmanship. As she trains hard, Tess watches with awe and admiration. He keeps complimenting Yule on how amazing she looks. It's clear from Yule's face that she's trying hard to ignore the persistent prince. Eventually, she manages to defeat her mentor, although he was going easy on her. The mentor, Count Guard, former captain of the Imperial Knights and the Crown Prince's current bodyguard, suggests they take a short break. He compliments Yule's skills, saying she has good form, as if she's wielded a sword before. Meanwhile, Tess quickly offers Yule a towel to wipe off her sweat. What a devoted and caring prince he is. Their moment together is interrupted by the sudden arrival of a certain person calling out to Yule by her name. It's clear the prince isn't fond of this person as he frowns upon seeing him. The newcomer is a young boy named Edel Bonart, eight years old. Edel explains that Yule missed their sword lesson, so he came to find her. He also greets Count Guard. 
Yule apologizes to Edel, explaining she forgot to tell him she couldn't make it today. Meanwhile, the prince stands there quietly, holding on to Yule's clothes. The two continue their conversation about swordsmanship, appearing close and friendly. The prince clearly doesn't like the dynamic between them. He grits his teeth in jealousy. Edel notices the prince after talking to Yule and tries to greet him formally. But Tess interrupts, shouting for him to go away. He immediately confronted the boy, scolding him for interrupting whenever he pleases and commanding him to leave quickly because Eusenil will be spending time with him today. In a fit of rage, he slaps Edel. Edel just closes his eyes and takes the hit, knowing he can't and shouldn't fight back against the prince. Count Guard tries to mediate between them, warning the prince that he'll strain himself if he pushes too hard and might risk fainting. But the prince isn't listening. He orders Guard to escort Edel out immediately. All of this happens right before Yule's eyes, and she clearly doesn't like the situation. She had hoped the scolding she gave Tess the other day would stop his tantrums, but apparently it hasn't. She quickly goes to Edel's side and asks if he's okay. Edel says he's fine. Tears start falling from Tess's eyes, and he says he's hurt too. He sobs uncontrollably, claiming he's more in pain than his rival. Seeing the prince distraught like that, Yule is at a loss for words or actions, knowing the prince is completely at fault this time. As time passes, the prince's obsession with her grows, leading him to try to separate her not only from Edel but also from everyone else around her. Whenever other kids approached her, even in a gathering, Tess would throw tantrums. As a result, the Heartland family became the subject of gossip, with people saying her family had brainwashed the prince to gain favor with the royal family. However, she didn't see Tess's obsession with her as a serious problem. She thought he was just clinging to her because he was a child and she was his first friend. Yule would grab Tess and sweetly tell him not to worry, making it clear that no matter who she meets, he will always be her important friend. This reassurance always calmed him down. Just by saying those words, Tess's childish outbursts would stop, and he would smile, saying he likes her. Before long, Tess had a growth spurt and stopped visiting Yule. Even Yule's mother found it odd not to see the stubborn prince around. Recently, the Duke said Tess couldn't go outside due to his growing pains, which made the Duchess express sincere concern, especially since Yule's requests to visit him were denied. They assumed the prince was in great pain. Hearing their conversation, Yule couldn't help but worry as well. She couldn't focus on the book she was reading, preoccupied with thoughts of Tess's well-being. Without filter, her mother asks if she's sad because the prince hasn't visited her for some time. Flustered, Yule denies being worried about him, saying she just misses her magic lessons at the palace. She's trying to hide her true feelings, but her mother isn't buying it. Then, we see the sweet side of the duke, kissing his wife on the cheek as she sips her tea. The Duchess suggests Yule should take the opportunity to have more sword lessons with Edel, but it's clear he wasn't on Yule's mind. Her mother continues, saying if she and Edel get engaged as a result of their friendship, it might be best. Hearing this, the Duke chokes. He tries to scold his wife, but she explains that it would help Yule put more distance between herself and the Crown Prince. This prompts Yule to ask if her mother's comment is due to rumors, but she clarifies she couldn't care less about gossip. Then, the Duchess says something that shocks Yule. She expresses a feeling that Yule growing closer to the Crown Prince wouldn't be good for her, based on her elf intuition. She seems serious about this, and Yule takes a moment to ponder her words. Lately, the Duchess has been quite vocal about her dislike for Tess. She considers the idea of getting engaged and thinks it's not a bad idea. If Yule had a fiancé, Tess would have to watch his behavior around her, and everyone would lose interest in her and her family. While it may seem like a logical choice considering all the factors, Yule doesn't like it. She tells her parents she has no plans to get close to anyone, as she'll eventually return to her original world. Becoming attached to this world would be troublesome, so she chooses not to have deep relationships with anyone here. To reassure her parents, she smiles and tells them not to worry about her connection with the prince. He's like a brother to her, nothing more. Contrary to what her mother said, Tess has grown considerably since she last saw him. He now acts like a proper royal, minding his manners and showing the demeanor expected of a prince. Yule is shocked to see Tess after so long and notices how tall he's grown. She almost calls him by his name but stops herself and addresses him as your majesty as she greets him. However, the prince doesn't allow her to bow her head. He informs her that he sent the guards away, so they're alone. With that fact, he urges her to stop speaking to him politely and not to bow to him either. Tess gently holds her hand and pleads with her to stop treating him like a stranger. He kisses her hand and says it breaks his heart to hear her speak so formally to him. Yule blushes at the prince's incredible transformation and how much he's improved over time. 
Tess takes this opportunity to tease her about how red her face is. Her cheeks turn even redder, and she stutters as she searches for words. Managing to regain her composure, Yule turns around and tells the prince to be quiet. She explains that she only feels nervous when she's at the palace, which is why her face is red. After all, she has to mind the prying eyes of the people and her etiquette, starting from the entrance checkpoint, which is proving to be exhausting. To reassure her, Tess says she doesn't need to bow to him, and if she wants, he'll change everything to make it convenient for her. She takes his words as a joke, knowing a child like him doesn't have the power to change the laws of the empire. But Tess speaks confidently, saying his methods will remain a secret for now. He asks her to be patient and observe from the sidelines. Although Yule can't clearly recall his expression that day, it was when her elf intuition first kicked in. Her concern was evident as she sensed something wasn't right. But after that day, Tess withdrew back into the palace. With demons causing chaos at the border, the ominous feeling faded from Yule's mind. Time passes, and we see the Empire celebrating the sixth birthday of the Crown Prince. Yet, with a somber expression, the countdown until the Heartland family's exile from the capital drops to 35 days. As we continue, we are taken to the banquet hall filled with people celebrating Tess' sixth birthday. Murmurs and gossips are filling the room. The reason there are so many guests is because this is the first official event that the palace has held since the recovery of the prince. All the nobles of the Viscount rank and higher were invited. And surely, everyone must be here to leave a good impression on the imperial family. Of course, our girl's family, the Hardrant family is attending as well, and we see our adorable Yule dressed up in a fancy dress. Sure enough, the other nobles' interest and gossips about them aren't stopping. According to them, the dress that Yule is wearing is a gift from his majesty. There are even rumors that his highness has gotten better thanks to her. Knowing that the Hardrant family is getting on good terms with the Imperial family, the other nobles see this as an opportunity to use them as a connection. Yule who is hearing all their plan sighs. She's getting exhausted from all of the opportunistic people around her. Lady Cheyenne Orin attends the celebration as well, wearing a pink dress that complements her orange hair. Despite Yule and Cheyenne being young, there are already rumors about them that the two are fighting for the Crown Prince's attention. All these stupid nobles think about is how to gain power. They don't care about the children's feelings at all. Finally, the main subject of the party arrives. We see the emperor, empress, and the crown prince make their grand entrance. However, it is obvious that the birthday celebrant himself is having a troubled expression on his face. Everyone in the hall expressed their sincere greetings to his majesty, and the emperor responded kindly. The emperor gives his wife a gentle kiss, praising her for the success of the banquet. Yule notices that his majesty is as devoted to his wife as ever, and all the other guests are happily expressing their joy upon witnessing the sweet scene. Setting everything aside, our girl realizes that this is the first time she is seeing Tess after the day in the library. She can't help but notice that her friend looks pale, making her wonder if Tess is sick. Then, Tess gaze locks with Yule, and his complexion immediately brightened up upon seeing our girl. This prince really loves Yule. He excitedly tries to run towards his friend. However, he was stopped by his mother, the Empress, reminding him to maintain his dignity as the Crown Prince. She emphasizes that everyone is watching his every move, so he must act with caution and not embarrass the royal family. However, Tess throws a fit, saying that he doesn't care about all the unnecessary crap. He just wants to go to Eusiniel. The other people hear his remarks, and were shocked that all the prince talks about is the lady of the Hardrant family. They take this as a sign that the Hardrant family is using their daughter to gain the favor of the prince. They say that they didn't expect this kind of cunning move from the Hardrant family and express their disappointment, commenting that our girl's family turned out to be the same as other royal families. All these negative rumors and gossips are starting to take their toll on our little girl. She clenches her fist, desperately holding herself back from saying anything. Fortunately, her parents are taking the situation easily. They gave our girl a bright smile, telling her not to pay attention to the rumors and just ignore them. Our girl, not wanting to cause any more trouble to her loving family, apologizes to Tess in a formal manner, surprising the little boy. She acts formal and distant towards Tess, that the prince immediately realizes that something is wrong. He tells Yule not to talk to him so formally and address him as she normally does, but our girl isn't backing down. She wants to show to everyone that the rumors aren't true, so that they won't bother the Hardrant family anymore. Yule formally greets Tess a happy birthday, even though she knows that this would hurt the prince's feelings. The prince is on the verge of crying at this point, meekly asking our girl why is she doing this. In our girl's point of view, she's only doing this cruel act because she has to draw a line between her and the prince to save her family. 
the celebration continues, and the guests leisurely enjoyed their time chatting with each other. Finally, our poor little girl can now breathe a sigh of relief. Everyone's attention is now drawn towards the banquet itself and not on her family. She it was truly a relief for her that His Majesty intervened earlier. He thanks Yule for her proper manner, saying that it is something expected from the Hardrin family. He dismisses Yule, saying that she should conclude her small talk with the prince and enjoy the party. Now, our girl is standing alone in the corner, trying her best not to attract any attention. Yule is aware that Tess will be making public appearances more often starting from now, so she should put some distance between them. However, the face that Tess made earlier still haunts our innocent girl. She didn't want to act so distant with her friend, but she had no choice. Still, we really can't blame Tess for not understanding the situation. He just turned six that day. He's still not aware of social classes and responsibilities. Edel then calls up to our girl, asking why she's in the corner all by herself. The boy states that everyone their age wanted to have a conversation with her, but our girl states that she doesn't want to interact with anyone. That's why she chose to isolate herself. Edel then comments that he can't just leave you'll all be herself, expressing that it is his duty as her friend. She asks if that's the reason why the boy cancelled all his sword lessons together with Yule once he was invited to visit the Imperial Knights. Edel was caught. He states that his dream was to become the captain of the Imperial Knights, so he won't be passing up that chance. Yule remarks that the opportunity was indeed quite unprecedented. As knights who serve the Imperial family, the Imperial Knights are an exclusive group that is notoriously difficult to join. She wonders how Edel received such an invitation. The boy revealed that his highness was the one to recommend him, surprising Yule. Our girl is aware that Tess despised Edel because he thinks that the boy is trying to steal Yule from him. So, it's a mystery why would his majesty vouch for Edel. However, the knight candidate just thinks of it as his majesty finally recognizing his talent and didn't put too much thought of it. Edel the remarks that it's worrying how Tess is constantly ill. Even though he has drank the foreign medicine prescribed to him, it's said that it didn't help one bit. This is the first time that our girl heard about Tess getting sick, that's why she let out a loud voice from the shock, catches the attention of the prince. Our girl gets closer to Edel, pressing for more details due to her extreme concern for her friend. However, to his majesty's eyes, Yule is being too close and clingy to Edel, thinking that they have something going on. Envy and jealousy filled the heart of the young prince. Right after Yule acted cold towards him, he now sees her clinging to another man, or so he thinks. As his emotion gets darker, a sudden flash of lightning and rumble of the thunder is experienced outside, giving our girl an ominous feeling. Our girl's memories of that day are still vivid. The palace was suddenly hit with a storm of thunder and lightning, breaking the window glass. At the same time, His Majesty the Prince suddenly collapsed. Worried, the emperor shouts for the physician to come immediately. Our girl was too stunned to react. All she can do is softly call for her friend's name as she observes him from a distance. The startled nobles panicked and started running away. They're all thinking about the same thing. A demon must be attacking the palace. Of course, Yule's family is of no exception. The duke carries our girl up and went home with their mother. Our girl tried to stay with Tess, but her father tells her that the physician will handing the prince and everything will be fine. Unfortunately, her father's words were wrong at that time. Everything didn't go back to normal, and she wasn't able to see Tess ever since. That was the last time she saw the friend she knew. After that day, the emperor exiled the Hardrant family to Valen, and 14 years later, the Tess she met was a completely different person. Yule's companies asked our girl what could she be thinking about to be dozing off in the middle of a tea party, to which our girl states that she was just looking back on the past. With a gentle smile on her face, she comments that she's reminiscing of all the events that led to this day. On this day, Eusiniel Hardrant is now 20 years old. Edel pries further, question what past is she talking about? However, his curiosity was abruptly interrupted by Lady Orin, elbowing him. Angry, Edel asks what was that all about, to which the lady reprimands him from prying any further. She wonders if the Order of the Knights normally lacks tactfulness and etiquette. The two continued bickering with each other, fighting about who's closer to our girl, making Yule laugh. Yule comments that the two are getting along well, making the both of the flustered. Edel states that it wasn't the case, rather, he's curious how Orin and Yule became close. You see, there was animosity between the two ladies, as they were both fighting for the prince's attention. Or at least that was the case for the other noble's eyes. In response, both Yule and Orin looked at each other and chuckle. Our girl reveals that after she got exiled, Orin kept writing letters to her, making sure to keep in touch, and that was when their friendship began. With a gentle look on her eyes, Yule states that if it wasn't for Orin, she wouldn't have known what was going on the capital. 
she comments that Lady Orin wrote regularly, unlike someone she knows, pertaining to Edel, making him feel guilty, but he insists that he did write her letters. Shortly after Yule stopped writing to Edel, Orin boasted that she's also been exchanging letters with Yule, surprising Edel. The man expresses his frustration, saying that he had to go through Orin just to know what our girl has been up to, making him feel uncomfortable. While sipping her tea, our girl wonders where the heck did Edel's letters disappear to. Orin then clarifies that she and Lady Yule aren't rivals. Neither of them ever wanted the position of the crown princess. Besides, the lady states that she's interested in someone else, then proceeds to give Edel the stickiest stare and most suggestive smile on earth. Unfortunately, the thick-headed knight didn't catch the hint. He's no clue what the girl is trying to imply. Poor Orin. The lady then remembers something of important, making her flinch a little. She asks our girl what happened at the Conceum, apologizing in advance if it's a topic that Yule doesn't want to talk about. Orin heard rumors that Lily was disrespectful towards our girl, so she would like to apologize in her stead. Yule tells her that it's fine, saying that it isn't Orin's fault. Despite that, Orin feels guilt about the action of her little sister. She states that it's all because their father spoils Lily too much. She reveals that her younger brother and her aren't very close to Lily. Our girl then recalls Orin's litter brother, Enhus. As she remembers, that young boy always blushes whenever he talks to our girl. Orin tells her that their father will probably ask Yule a favor to pardon Lily, but our girl doesn't think she has that kind of authority. Her friend then comments that the prince will probably listen to her. Yule then looks to the side, feeling sad, as she comments that it has been 14 years since they have seen each other, so she doubts that Tess will listen to her anymore. Orin wonders if that's really the case, stating that everyone in the castle thinks that the two have a special relationship. Well, leaving that aside, Orin remarks that Lily will probably learn her lesson from this. Our girl then states that she only let it slide because she was Orin's sister, but if she ever disrespects her again, she won't be so forgiving. As the dusk arrives, the friends concluded their tea party and our girl sends them off. As she walks back to her place, something is clearly troubling her, evident on the melancholic expression on her face. She ended up coming to a particular place again before she even realized it. It's the tree that her parents planted as celebration for her birthday, where Tess and her often played when they were little. She honestly thought that the tree would have died since no one was taking care of it when they got exiled. Our girl is glad to see it well and all grown up. A sudden gust of wind then blows through our girl's hair. She then closes her eyes and states that she made it clear that they have to put some distance between them. As it turns out, Yule is speaking to Tess who magically appeared right behind her. The naughty prince grabbed her waist, saying that he had no other choice. He hugs Yule tightly and rested his tired head on her shoulder, remarking that Yule wasn't coming to him so he had to find her instead. In a cold tone of voice, Yule states that she has already told the prince not to come to their estate, but Tess protests that he used to come visit in the past. Tears then began falling from the prince's eyes, asking his childhood friend if she has really come to hate him now. He apologizes to our girl, saying that he will even spare Lily Cheyenne if she wishes to, if that will make Yule warm up to him again. The desperate prince begs Yule not to hate him, so our girl clarifies that she doesn't hate Tess. She doesn't hate him, however, he's the emperor now, so they cannot treat each other as friends like before. Yule doesn't want any strange rumors about her family spreading again just because she's getting too close to the emperor. However, Tess grabs her hand firmly, reassuring her that it won't happen. No one will ever bother them again. With a gentle smile and teary eyes, he promises that nothing bad will happen to her and her family. He proudly states that he will give her anything she wants and desire. Our girl's expression was that of shock. The Tess in front of him right now is saying that same words with the same look on his face when they were young. She thought that she doesn't know this version of Tess anymore, but it looks like time hasn't changed the sweet boy one bit. She then realizes the possibility that maybe, just maybe, she is that one who has changed. Acknowledging Tess's feelings, she asks the Emperor if she can treat him like she used to before. Hearing this made Tess' heart flutter from extreme happiness. However, Yule clarifies that she won't do it when there are other people around, and Tess shouldn't come to their estate again because her parents might feel uneasy with him around. The Emperor agrees and tightly hugs Yule, expressing his gratitude. Our girl tries to push him away, saying that she cannot breathe from the hug. Despite that though, our girl is also delighted by how things have played out and that Tess is as clingly as ever. It might have taken them 14 years to get here, but everything is fine now. She has been admitted into the Conceum, and can freely visit the Imperial Library as well. From this point on, she can just focus on her research about finding ways to go back to her world.
She gently hugs Tess back, feeling a sense of safety. However, unbeknownst to her, her friend's gentle expression from before is now long gone. He gazes into nothingness, seemingly potting something evil. What will happen next? Will the relationship of the two return to how it used to be? What could this unpredictable emperor be plotting? Stay tuned for the next episode and as always, it is our destiny to discover new manhwas.